Okay, um, hi, my name is Jessie Lynn Dunn. Um, I'm currently a postdoc here at Stanford. I'm working between the departments of genetics and bioengineering. Um, I've been working on a combination of um, different types of data, and I'll tell you a bit about that. Um, and to give you a bit of an idea of my background and where I'm coming from and what sorts of data I've been working with. Um, so I really have this multi-scale background. I've worked all the way from the wet lab to clinical research, um, all the way up to learning about macrophysiology. Um, so I worked at the CDC for um, a fair while uh, separating host and pathogen DNA. And this was an interesting project that worked on both the wet lab side, actually separating DNA at the wet lab bench, and also on the bioinformatics side, so understanding all the complications that come with integrating different species of DNA into one sample and on the bioinformatics end, how to separate that out. Um, I also have worked um, in the vascular aging field, working with a special cell type called endothelial cells. And again, this was on the wet lab side with animals and cells, as well as on the bioinformatics side. So understanding how we can extract all of these large types of omics data. So this is from the genome to the transcriptome, the epigenome, metabolome, and so on. Um, and in that work, uh, one of the interesting things was in actually how to bring these disparate omics data types together. Because I think when a lot of us think about extremely large databases, we think about multiple types of data that exist within the database. And so even within omics, there's a variety of different data types that we need to handle to bring together. Um, and so some of the challenges that I've been working with here at Stanford are, on top of multi-omics data, how can we start to bring in other data types? So now we have the ability to collect data from, for example, wearable sensors, where we can collect continuous heart rate, skin temperature, at a resolution of one measurement per minute over the course of several years, and bringing this together with something like omics data or clinical data actually is a really interesting challenge. Um, and then finally, bringing all this together for practical use. So if we have all of this information, we can build predictive models, but really what is the practical implementation in the clinic? So all of these um, I'm happy to discuss in a bit more detail. Um, and to give you even more um, detail on these different data types that I've been working with, from the multi-omics perspective, we have more than um, 14 different omics that we work with. We have several different wearable devices collecting many different types of data. And then we also have more standard electronic health records. Um, and finally, I'll just touch briefly upon some of the challenges specifically with working with wearable device data, because I think this is a rapidly evolving field where we see that new technologies come off online, fall offline very rapidly and the data flows and the storage and analytics really need to change and adapt with this evolving uh, field. So I'm happy to delve into any details on how we can process the data, how we actually work with changing data flows, um, the modularity of the workflows, the scalability, all of these end up being quite important. Um, so with that, I guess I'll go ahead and pass it on um, to, I'm not sure who's next, we'll see the next slide here. Um, to Priya. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so thanks to all the organizers for having us here. Uh, my name is Priya, um, and um, I'm actually a biomedical systems engineer at the Stanford Center for Genomics and Personalized Medicine. Okay, um, so just to give you guys an idea, the Stanford Center for Genomics and Personalized Medicine, also, called, also known as SCGPM, is actually uh, part of the School of Medicine and the Department of Genetics. And um, it was basically created uh, with this overarching mission of having a center where you can explore patient-focused um, medicine that can sort of monitor the entire genome of an individual and then use that to improve the, you know, predictability and uh, both improve the predictability and, uh, you, know, um, you know, your disease prediction and uh, prevention and in the treatment of other conditions like cancer, diabetes, uh, et cetera. 
So genomics, as you all know, is, uh, you know, requires technologically advanced facilities. And um, so SEGPM has become this big umbrella organization which has a couple of multiple service centers under it. Uh, the first of which is the Genetics uh, Bioinformatics Service Center, uh, which was basically formed to facilitate uh, massive scale genomics. Uh, I'm part of the of GBSC, and the goal is to provide you know the best um, in class, high performance uh, computing infrastructure for um, for genomics and cutting edge bioinformatics. So we have you know like 2,800 cores and um, over seven petabytes of um, uh, uh, secure storage, uh, high performance computing storage, and you know we also have uh, sort of maintained these multiple over 500 bioinformatics packages. Um, the second center is actually the genome sequencing um, service center, uh, which basically is um, uh, you know was created to uh, to provide uh, Stanford researchers with cost effective, um, high throughput um, sequencing. And the third is actually the Bioinformatics as a Service Center, which is a, a consulting service that we provide to the Stanford community as, at large. Uh, it's a sort of pay-as-you-go model uh, to help with uh, researchers with uh, downstream analysis and uh, data interpretation. Um, so my background, um, I didn't always start out in genomics and uh, bioinformatics. Uh, my background actually I do have a background in large-scale computing, but it's actually in astronomy. Um, I was part of uh, one of NASA's um, four large observatories called the Chandra X-ray um, Observatory, um, and I was part of the Chandra X-ray Center, which is the mission center, uh, control center for the Chandra X-ray Observatory, and there I was um, actually deeply involved in benchmarking X-ray spectral data, so benchmarking spectral uh, X-ray spectral models for interpreting astrophysical plasmas. Um, um, I'm also really, I have a background in machine learning and have a deep interest in recommender systems. And so just to give you guys a context to where I'm coming from, uh, some recent projects that I've been involved in um, here at the SEGPM is um, one is the first one is SciReader. SciReader is actually uh, essentially a cloud-based recommender system for biomedical literature, and um, the motivation here is to create like a Netflix for rec uh, for biomedical you know Netflix for recommender. Netflix for biomedical literature. So just like there's a data deluge in everything else, uh, you know, in all other fields, even the field of scientific publications, um, you know, it's increasing at an uh, eye-popping uh, pace. There are new journals that are popping up. The digital libraries are going online, and it's really hard for researchers to keep abreast of what's relevant in their field. And so we've actually focused specifically on biomedical literature, and we've uh, we've created this uh, recommender engine at SciReader.com. I don't have time to actually go in for a quick demo, uh, but we think it's really cool because we use some interesting algorithms like um, topic modeling and other machine learning algorithms and. Uh, what we've done essentially is we have uh, created a topic model of PubMed. And for those of you who are familiar, PubMed is essentially this huge uh, um, repository of, uh, you know, maintained by the NIH, which has a fairly comprehensive collection of everything in biomedicine. And topic models for, uh, you know, as many of you probably already know, is, are essentially these statistical models that can be used to um, infer or understand abstract topics, uh, you know, that are latent in the large corpora or large bodies of text. And so what we've done is we took a whole year worth of PubMed data and actually ran topic modeling on it. Um, we have some other, uh, SciReader has some other interesting, um, uh, uh, you know, we have some other interesting features. You know, we allow sharing, discussion, uh, discussing and reviewing of papers. And um, the other thing I think that we do that is cool is uh, we actually do Twitter recommendations. So we um, both, mon we monitor, parse and mine uh, tweets from all prominent journals, and then we actually uh, cross-link them with all the PubMed articles. So when you get your recommendation feed, which gets updated every day, you will not only get, you know, what are the most relevant new publications in your area of interest, but also, um, hey, who's talking about it? What's the new thing that came up? What are people tweeting about? Because apparently that's the way uh, a lot of the information about new publications seems to come out these days. Um, moving on really quickly, uh, another, this is an experimental project that I've been involved in. It's 
that's um, leveraging the cloud for large-scale GWAS. We had a bunch of other uh, speakers who talked a little bit about GWAS. And the main idea here is to see if we could actually use uh, the cloud architecture to perform, uh, that's a typo, it should be a meta-analysis to, to, uh, to actually compare meta-analysis versus uh, mega-analysis uh, while managing privacy concerns. Um, and so as part of this, we are actually also exploring, um, you know, running machine learning algorithms on encrypted data, and this is something that, you know, could be interesting in the future given, um, you know, the HIPAA privacy, etc. cetera. Uh, the third project I wanted to quickly just uh, mention is the Children's Metabolic Health Center, and this is actually interesting because uh, it uh, deals a lot with integrating patient data from uh, very disparate sources, the genome sequencing data, electronic health records, uh, metabolomic profiles, um, and so on. And so this was just to give you sort of a context about where I'm coming from, and I'm happy to hand it off to the next person, uh, Christine. I didn't know that mega analysis was a typo. I think we've just invented a new term. <laughs> You're the first in its field. Oops. Oh, no. Now my joke is uh, ruined. Well, anyway, uh, I, have, I have three titles. I'll move through them quickly. They don't really fit on your um, usual 16 by 9 slides, so apologies. But um, it's easy to find me. What's cut off at the bottom is Christine at SDSC. Um, I lead uh, basically all the IT that goes around the actual operation of the supercomputer um, from the virtualization platforms, the cloud, the data center, networking, um, all of that stuff. And I split my time between SDSC and NCSA, which is the other supercomputer center that's in Urbana-Champaign, Illinois, um, where I lead uh, an initiative called the National Data Service, and I'll, I'll show you a couple screenshots of what we've developed. And then last but not least, I'm also Deputy Director of the West Big Data Innovation Hub, which is one of the um, programs through the uh, National Science Foundation that tries to catalyze uh, uh, partnerships between unlikely people, so academia and government, nonprofits and industry, um, around um, a few different thematic areas, one of them personalized medicine. Um, in the 13 western states, so everything from uh, Montana to New Mexico and then west. Okay, this was supposed to be my, my funny slide. So I have been in computing um, uh, 25 years. It is okay to laugh. Um, my <laughs> it looks more like an arrest shot or like I just left a Ren fair. But I really have been in computing 25 years, uh, mostly at University of California, where I worked at, uh, have worked and do work at UC San Diego. They give me my paycheck, which I appreciate, and uh, but also a short stint at our office of the president. And I've worked at a lot of software companies that start with I. Probably all that needs saying about that part of my life. Um, I am not an astrophysicist <laughs> or a cosmologist, which is um, what most supercomputing centers are populated with. I, if you had to classify me, I'm an infrastructure person. My master's is in uh, systems of systems engineering, um, a combination of engineering classes and, and business. So just to focus in real quick, to give you some context for my answers, and it is okay to laugh, this is like the best meme ever about big data. Unless, um, I did use this once in Portugal recently, and it, they obviously do not watch Star Trek there. It was not translated into Portuguese, which is very sad. Um, also, um, one of the reasons I was happy to take my married name, I'm now C. Kirk, so woo. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I work with a lot of data scientists, who use a lot of Twitter data and also Weibo, which I will learn to pronounce one of these days correctly. Um, and, and you might have heard it called the uh, Twitter tweets or the fruit flies of social science. This is very true. Um, there are also uh, some interesting healthcare applications. I'm actually on an NIH R01 for academics in the audience, uh, a grant where we're looking at how can you predict the spread of HIV using social media? probably sounds crazy, why would you do that? Well, there's a, a one to two year lag on the official data from the CDC. So if you can get any context on trends, especially on context, is it you know related to sexual activity or injectables, et cetera, this is you know pretty good information to come by. And um, you know we see a lot of the same pain points that you see um, in other parts of uh, 
data science. But what's really fun, uh, a fun challenge about um, social media is that you're constantly trying to keep up with the ingestion while you're pre-computing things. Uh, and then just the general need for tools to get easier, and I think we've seen a lot of uh, good examples of um, breaking new ground in that area. So I had so much to say, no memes on this slide, apologies. Um, but these have brought up some, um, you know, some of, some of our work with domain scientists, um, especially in the social sciences, has really given us meaty things to work on for the computer science and data scientists, as well as people like myself who are in research computing. Um, you know, we're a huge user of the Stanford Core NLP, but we find that, um, I'm not blaming, uh, something wonderful developed here at Stanford. But we're finding that um, there are probably uh, better infrastructure architectures that we could be using to, um, you know, speed things up um, and, and not to, to not misapply resources placed with it. And then, of course, um, some pieces of topic modeling are just very computationally intensive. And so we're trying to figure out, you know, what um, Base, can we make recommendations of what platforms to use and what architectures to use based on what someone's trying to do? Uh, being at a supercomputer center, working on a lot of things at scale, how can we um, make the best use of both things? Uh, people tend to use the systems they've always used, right? I've got a login here, I've got cycles, let me just, you know, force my job up and see how, uh, how quickly I can get the results back. But if we could do a better job coordinating, like say there are some things that can run parallel, but then not just dumping the results to a parallel file system, but pushing that back to the cloud, where you know maybe you just need more high throughput computing runs, uh, which we, actually we see a lot of this research can be done on the cloud, um, you know as well, and then just farming it back to HPC for those um, things that really need the big iron. I think that's uh, how it should work, uh, and then just some. Um, Research data management concepts really need to be embedded. You know, we, we don't ask people, should we make um, all the computing that you're using secure, right? That would be ridiculous. We don't ask them, should your website be accessible to people who use a screen reader, right? Why do we um, pose the question to researchers, do you want to find your data later? Do you want to reproduce what you've done? You know, we need to embed some of these things um, so that those choices don't have to be choices. And so here's just one example from a project I've been working on. The PI is Amarnath Gupta, who's um, uh, an expert who specializes in poly stores and graph analytics principally. Um, and what's, uh, what I wanted to show you about this, it's not just one database with a web front end. This is, you know, the kind of the usual thing that, that you do on a research project. We're actually using four different databases that uh, take different pieces, like Asterix DB, this is a, an Apache incubator project for Mike Carey, who some of you I know know. Um, and it's really good at ingesting stuff at a high volume. We're using Solar, of course, for um, text, uh, text analytics, and then Neo4j for um, our graph uh, database, and then you know, Postgres is just a, a trusty engine. So some of these things, um, I, I alluded to um, su how they suggested new architectures. Here's just one example. So we, um, at SDSC and actually at NCSC, we run uh, OpenStack clouds. And this isn't because we're going to be the new AWS or GCE. This is so that we can really study things and so our, um, our researchers can develop, um, you know, new algorithms, new software, and be able to see the entire stack, not just on the node, but what's happening in the management nodes, right? How, how is what you're running, um, can it be better coordinated with other systems? With the idea of scaling it up for commercial cloud. So this is a detail of our OpenStack cloud and everything in green is stuff that's been added recently or is in the process of being added. So of course, you know, GPUs are very exciting, um, you know, give us new capabilities, especially for people who uh, don't want to exhaust their HPC cycles. Uh, OpenStack, actually, at the moment, the current release doesn't support GPUs, so I think we're a release away from that. But we've seen, and I, uh, I think I alluded to on, on two slides ago, um, how dedicated Flash could probably speed up some of the other things that we're doing. The problem is, is that you can only um, provision dedicated Flash in the smallest increment of the physical drive, and we tend to buy at the smallest one terabyte drives. 
a lot of our jobs need 100 gig of flash. So if we decide to go with provisioning dedicated flash, that means inherently 90% of that resource is never used. So that doesn't seem um, like the most efficient use of resources, but we'd like to compare that against what we're getting now. Maybe it is okay to be a little wasteful. And then just a quick uh, screenshot about what we're up to at the National Data Service. This is um, uh, more on the front end, trying to develop interfaces that make it easier for your average domain researcher uh, to use some of these data analytics and data management packages. And so we're using um, Kubernetes for orchestration uh, with Docker, although we also um, build singularity containers for people, especially if they're using HPC, that's more portable. Um, you go to a web interface, you find the tool you want, or you look it up by a tag, and you can click add and then launch, and it worries about all the dependencies. Um, one reason that we did this is we found there were a lot of tools where we would ask people, well, why did you choose this over that? And they'd say, I just couldn't get the other thing running. And so we thought, well, that's a terrible reason uh, for that software not to get further, especially if someone else has figured it out. Um, on the right here is data DNS, and it, the UI is the least, least interesting thing about the project. Um, what we've done here is we've tried to put, um, I think people agree that when you publish, uh, you, you have a publication, you should also upload your data. But really for a lot of science, you can't do anything with it if you put the data up. So you, you need a place for the Jupyter Notebook to run. And so um, we've taken a lot of open source and other tools that exist and put them together in this interface called Data DNS, which helps you see all that alongside. One of the motivations for the scientists that um, uh, contributed to this, and these are all uh, uh, data sets that are range from 70 terabytes to 200 terabytes, is that it's very hard for their collaborators to get copies of their data. There's more data than their own research lab can, can get to, so they're leaving a lot of interesting discoveries on the table. They're hoping that people will come and run their analysis and then contribute new Jupyter notebooks of what they found with the data. So, and I'll yield the rest of my time to Somali. So, um, thank you for that, uh, Christine. So, what I thought we would do today is uh, I would start this off with a few questions that, you know, would be obvious questions for a brilliant panelist of technologists and scientists, and then we can open up the floor to, to the, um, to all of you. So, Christine, maybe I'll start off with uh, you. Since you, ha you are running a very sophisticated um, analytical platform for your researchers, what are the fundamental challenges you are seeing with respect to just the data itself? You know, the, not the downstream tools, but just the data. Sure. So I would have answered this question a little differently a few months ago, but I had something surprising happen um, that really gave me a new perspective on my work with data. Um, I, f I don't think there's enough awareness about how important it is to, to keep your data and make it um, available for others to do things work with. I was working on a project and I won't give you the person's gender or birth date or county. I think that was my name. <laughs> uh, but I was working on a project. We developed what we thought was a pretty good algorithm for um, uh, doing something with a certain data set. And we wanted to look back at the same researcher's 2014 data associated with the paper to see is this you know, better at predicting something than the last algorithm used. And when we went to get the data, the researcher said, I have no idea where it is, it's lost. And what surprised me wasn't that they lost the data, it was that they didn't care. They had published the paper, they'd moved on, big deal. And um, I, that's when I had the epiphany of, we have to build this in, this needs to be like making things secure, making things accessible, you know, research data management um, needs to be baked in and, and, and hidden so that uh, data doesn't just rely on how much the individual researcher is aware how important reproducibility is. Yeah, I, I think that that's really important because uh, I think that the new paradigm is that data is the product. It's no longer that it's the means to an end, you know, it's the means to a publication, it's the means to g getting a grad. It is the product. And then so for all the developers um, out there, you know, you should know that there is a research there are researchers and clinicians waiting on this side and they want your data. So 
from the outset, when you when you when you plan out your uh, you know your your app or your tool or whatever it is that you're developing, make sure that you know data is the first class product. It's the first class. It's a first class citizen now, and it it needs to be packaged in a way that researchers down the road can use it again and again. And one thing I might add to that, um, a challenge that comes with being on the ground, generating that data, and then working with it is that there are a lot of exceptions to data. So something will go wrong, wrong in an experiment or there will be a patient who has certain exceptions. And so when you have this huge database of tens of thousands or millions of patients, when you have exceptions, when you find things that are outside of the norm, there's only so much that cleaning data can do. And so there's a lot of metadata that needs to somehow be associated with that data to account for exceptions and potentially change the infrastructure downstream. And I think right now, because there's so many different data types that we work with across the board, we don't have a good way yet of doing that. <coughs> So you, uh, so just to, uh, to lean back on that point, um, fundamentally interesting science is about the exceptions often. And so at some point, if you start throwing stuff out of the boat, you're going to end up throwing out the oars. I was wondering what your reaction to that is, which is how do you draw the line between, uh, you know, the, uh, the statistically unreasonable and the scientifically interesting, which seems like a, a, a distinction to blur. Yeah, and so I guess I would really emphasize the importance of working with domain experts because I think that there's some challenges associated with how do you appropriately clean data. Um, one interesting example I can give is that in um, Stanford Hospital records, I find heart rates of 400. We know that that can't exist. So we know that that's a case where we have data that we need to throw out. But if we see something like heart rates of you know 140, 120, are, these are things potentially within reason, potentially interesting exceptions. <laughs> right, and so, so, so essentially having the ability to associate metadata, so, so you want the rawest form of the data, you want those heart rates even of 400 to be able to say at this stage of the game I threw out this data because of X, Y, and Z. And right now the infrastructure doesn't really allow for annotating the uh, workflows necessarily at different stages of the data existence. So I guess that would be my response. Yeah. So it would be to keep everything. Keep everything, annotate everything, document everything. Because mm -hmm. you know storage is cheap um, because you don't know. Because I mean, 15 years down the road, you may be asking questions using technologies that have not even been invented. And then this data is going to be useless. And you don't want to do that. So yeah. I'm, I'm going to ask a follow-up question. So I know storage is cheap, but when you are talking about petascale data, what happens? So, so we, have, we have GitHub for scripts. We need GitHub for data, essentially. That's, that would be the solution. So okay. compress it. <laughs> well, for me, I, yes, I agree with everything that was said, but we have so many copies and copies of copies and copies of copies of copies that it's ridiculous. And the actual data that's useful is, is a subset of that. And that's, I think, one of the big challenges we haven't addressed because it's difficult. Um, you know, I, I could see when I look in my garage if I put a box in the garage, right? <laughs> We've done the equivalent of putting our, my garage into a mini storage, into a warehouse, and then it gets too difficult for someone to pick apart. If the data um, went into archives or even just to working archives where it was maybe a short term, three to five years, with better management around it, we could do a better job of making sure we didn't replicate things. And also if we made sure people weren't storing things on their individual laptops as a primary place and then backing that up somewhere, mm -hmm. um, there's just uh, so many extra copies of things that are unnecessary. And we need someone, it's not a sexy problem, but we need people to tackle that. So, you know, uh, at least in the NIH domain, one of the things I've seen they have started to do is for large-scale projects like ENCODE, where there is a large consortium of 200 labs submitting data, they end up um, doing like a, you know, at a high-level met <laughs> metadata management system, they build that, and they build it into their, their project guidelines where Fundamentally, funding doesn't go out unless the researchers submit the data that they promise that they are generating. And then with each data, they are submitting metadata associated with it. And 
I mean, I don't know if NIH is actually keeping copies, but I think at the large scale, repositories are really becoming multi-tenths of petabyte scale. So not everything goes into, you know, these archives. So I do think that at an institutional level, these things become challenging because these are something I think about from my community point of view. And I find that, you know, getting researchers to submit their result in a central location that would be useful for downstream research in a meaningful way is, I think, is a fundamentally hard problem. I also think that the agencies can help by showing leadership in this area, not just with the data management plans, which were a good, good step uh, in that direction. The NIH has been um, touting the FAIR principles, and I, I believe that they seem to be following what's happening in the EU with Horizon 2020, where um, uh, researchers and institutions will have to submit their FAIR data plan and then publish on a FAIR data endpoint. And so this is, um, this is a hybrid of this idea of, you know, there's one place that you submit everything, having it distributed at institutions, that'll require also institutional support, but I'm hoping this is the direction we're moving in. I mean, I... It, it seems to me like we are using some of the wrong words here. We're talking about data sets as a product, but that's not the right way to think about it. If we keep all the raw data in an invariant form, keep one copy, then the thing we need to save is the rules that get us from the raw data to the data set that's, and, and the rule set, very small. So kind of to uh, what Chad and I was saying earlier uh, about keeping the models, keeping, keeping the, um, the rules that get us from here to there. And that's something that can be saved in a very small amount of space and then can reproduce that data set anytime we want to, as long as the raw data is always captured and always invariant, right? Yeah, I agree with that. I think that uh, not enough of um, academia is, or not enough of us are talking about provenance and almost none of the uh, people on the ground, the people with their fingers on the keyboards even know what that means. And so in, in my group at, at SDSC, in my cloud um, integration group, I've had to work with them to say, okay, we're not being handed how to do this, but here are some ways that we need to keep track of when we've done basic data cleaning, spell checking, right? Uh, uh, some, no, no one's asking, but they should be asking, and we need to be ready for when this is something that's required. I actually want to jump in here and say that, so like I know I'm still new to how NIH is doing things and does things, but I do know that in astronomy, for example, because the data is always with its taxpayers' money, so, and there's no one person or one institute that ever, ever owns all the data. It's always, you know, countries or, uh, you know, like NASA uh, and so on. And so typically what happens is that uh, somebody who submitted a grant, you know, they have access, they have sole access to the data for maybe a year, but after that the data does become public. And so everything is archived. And then, then there's a version control of, of all the, you know, the, the pipeline cleaning so that, like, like you said, the raw data is saved, stored once, it's archived, and then every time, you know, new pipelines are developed for data cleaning, you know, there's, there's, you know, the newest version is stored, but everything is annotated and it's sort of all there historically because this is tons of data and it's not really easy to go out and recreate and redo any of these experiments. So, <laughs> I, I mean, it's just something we could borrow from another field I mean, and, May, may, may I ask, do you have an estimate of how much data exist in, exists in astronomy? Yes, it's definitely now of the petabyte scale. I mean, it's been growing rapidly. So in today, like today you have the James Webb telescope that's going up. Chandra has been up for, you know, 20 plus years. So we're talking in the petabyte scale. So petabyte scale of astronomy data across multiple sites? Yes. Well, okay. and it's not just the data, it's the, then you have the simulation data that comes after the data, and that's also in the petabytes. I know, because I've got about a petabyte of it myself, right? Uh, and that's another place where we're not managing well a lot of the derived data products. Uh, and so you have people who just run, the, I don't think they run the exact same jobs, but I, I think there's nothing preventing people from running the exact same jobs over and over because they can't easily get at simulations. So, you know, on the genomics front, I, I am hopeful that the sequencing will get cheap enough that at some point, at least for healthy people, 
not keeping hold of the data, you know, keeping the data forever will probably not be relevant. But again, in cases where, for example, cancer, you know, you do want these, this data to be preserved for a long time. So, yeah, thinking about data and keeping track of it is, I think it's really important. And I'm hoping that someone here in this room sort of, you know, goes off and starts working on the GitHub for data. Well, and who knows, maybe in 40 years, you know, lo looking back to that slide you showed from 1975, maybe 40 years ahead, this will all be about uh, DNA, you know, research data management. <laughs> maybe that will be our medium. Um, the other thing I actually wanted to ask about is tools, because um, much like you, Christine, I've been noticing that, you know, if you have 100 researchers, they are working with at least 500 different tools. And I, I kind of wanted to ask, like, do you see this proliferation of tools really helping research, or is it just a lot of noise, or, I mean, how do you make sense of all these tools? How do you keep track of, like, <coughs> you know, tools going from ideas to products, you know, how do they survive that, that time timeline? So maybe Jesse, you can start. Sure, um, so I think talking about these fair principles is actually very relevant to tools as well. Um, when tools are well documented, um, the publications describe well how to use them and there's really relevant applications, then the tool proliferation I think expands pretty astronomically. Um, and so I, maybe that's the way that you can start to vet tools in the field is to see how well they are documented. Um, but it is a challenge in that there are lots of publications out there claiming to use certain tools. There's not enough details about versioning and so on and running it in a certain environment. So this is where maybe Docker or Singularity comes into play. Um, but it is challenging to keep up with this proliferation of tools. So maybe we need a side eater for tools? <laughs> so I would say though there's hope that there is, um, there are Darwinian forces when it comes to software, right, and that, that's helpful. Things fall away. That can also be bad though. Sometimes wonderful software is developed inside of, um, you know, connected to a grant and, and does neat things and then it's not operationalized. So one of the things that I try to do in my different roles is to say what, what neat things are coming out of different grants that could just be put into regular services that we offer. One example is, um, I, I want to say out of uh, Indiana, uh, I think Beth Playley was the original PI, and it's called Rapid RPID. And it's this idea uh, that, of course, everybody knows, or most people know, to assign a digital object identifier, a DOI, to your final data product. But what do you do with all of those versions of data before that? And there's a simple approach and, and a great software package where you can assign temporary PIDs so that you know um, the difference between the, this publication's data and what it's referring to and then this final one with the DOI. There's lots of examples like that. With the National Data Service, we've been working with different groups. Um, ESIP is one, uh, EarthCube's another, uh, where we build custom catalogs for those groups. So when you log in, you only see the nine tools that is needed. Or another one, um, TerraRef, which is a big project about um, agricultural uh, phenotyping. And so when they have a workshop and they're talking about their project, they um, pull up, they all go to the same web page, pull up the same tools that are already can access the uh, terabytes of data. And so, um, you know, it's, it's a way of trying to cut down on the noise and also increase the accessibility to those tools and to make use of the data. I think the other thing I would say is like, for example, you should, I mean, it's good to have these standards like benchmarks or gold standards, like for example, you know, the, the GAT gave the variant, uh, the, the pipeline developed by the Broad. Um, so there are so many new tools coming on, Sention, uh, Microsoft has come up with their thing, Google, the Google API uh, to do variant calling. Um, but there is a gold standard that they all have to, a minimum gold standard that they all have to sort of meet. And then then, then they can tout their improvements above that, it may be efficiency, or, you know, whatever else it is. But it's good to also have these sort of standard metrics that sort of all these tools have to meet before they even pass the first bar. So do you think publications have a role in simplifying, you know, data access, tool access? Well, it's the currency of academic scholarship, so it has a role no matter what, well, you know, how we'd hope. And, it, and I, 
uh, not, maybe not answering your question exactly, but the incentives are all about publishing, right? And not, and not as enough about data. Uh, and so hopefully some of those incentives can morph to reward the right things. I don't know if you were asking, should we be publishing papers about tools? That's maybe a, another I, I, topic. You know, it's, it's the enforcement in some sense. It's the regulatory aspect of it. So much like NIH will not give out money unless you have submitted data. Maybe, you know, publications, the journals could impose certain things, which makes sure that all the tools are getting cataloged correctly. Metadata that is reported in the paper, they are getting cataloged correctly and so forth. So I would say, oh, sorry, not to hog the answer, but um, this is a place where um, uh, peer, peers and crowdsourcing of checking things is essential. That's why reproducibility is so important. It can't just be the journals being the gatekeepers, <laughs> that everything has to be up, you know, and online so that people can check this and then say, hey, this version you're referring to doesn't exist or I can't download this. And so I'd probably answer also in two ways, that we have this sort of open publishing revolution going on where we have PLOS journals and bioarchive and we have this ability to sort of crowdsource the review, but then also PLOS journals, for example, the editors will actually go through each figure of your paper and ensure that the data and the metadata to reproduce that figure is there or else they won't publish your paper. And so I think in that way, they're really starting to enforce the fact that if you're not going to put your data up and make it public, then your paper is not welcome in their journal. So publishers are starting to help enforce that open data policy. And then to go on to the sort of crowdsourcing the review idea, we've talked about this a bit in that when you have a paper go through the review process, you have maybe three reviewers and an editor. But tools like BioArchive or Archive allow the greater community to start to get into more detail about what's really missing. Because sometimes data can be put up, but it's not the data that will actually reproduce the figure. And only the grad student in a lab put away somewhere will be the one to figure that out. So there really needs to be a venue for scientists at all levels to be able to speak up when things aren't right.